Oh, perfect. So good evening, or good evening, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> good evening. Uh, the night was short, so it's more or less evening in my time zone. Um, we are continuing there where we have ended last week, which have been temporal difference learning. And today we're going to generalize this, which I've called multi-step bootstrap. So what we have learned so far as a recap is basically how to learn an optimal decision and to make predictions on state and action values in unknown MDPs. And basically we have used extreme learning cases. The one extreme learning case was Monte Carlo, which we have learned first, where we said, okay, we are like starting somewhere in our state space. We take a complete trajectory towards the end of an episode where the um, episode is terminated and we learn from this entire episode. So we had the update over the full length of the trajectory. And then last week, we basically did the exactly opposite thing. We used simple difference learning, where we just used one state transition, which we sampled. So where we took the data, we observed like, where's the new state? What is the reward of this state transition? And then from there on, we bootstrapped using the state estimate of the successor state, right? But we have just used like one data sample and bootstrapped. Here in Monte Carlo, we have used, let's say, all data samples which are available until the, term, until the episode terminates, and we did not bootstrap at all, right? And today we are going to discuss in different scenarios and in different variants everything which is basically in between Ooh. these two edge cases. So basically learning from a little bit of data and then doing bootstrapping. So that's why I've called this lecture today multi-step bootstrapping. The table of contents for today is that we first do um, n-step methods, which is n-step TD prediction control, and then just a more or less recap, I would call it, the uh, off-policy learning. So if we have a behavior policy, which is not our target policy. And then we're going to, um, I would say, switch the viewpoint to so-called TD Lambda, which is very related to multi-step learning, but has a different viewpoint, as we will see later on, but I don't want to spoiler around that. Okay, so let's start with n-step prediction. Um, I've more or less already told you what n-step prediction basically means, because we are going to combine the two extreme cases, which we have seen last week and the week before. So that means that we will take some steps from real transitions within the MDP. We will take the data from those transitions, process it, and then after the nth step, we will do bootstrapping by using the estimate of this state. So one step TD, which sometimes is also called just TD0, we will see why that zero comes from that is actually related to TD lambda. Uh, was what we have learned last week. So we take one data transition, one data sample, and from there on we bootstrap using the state value estimate of the successor state. Monte Carlo, or called infinitely step TD, is basically without bootstrapping. And now we are going to also discuss all of these intermediate cases where we take a few steps, a few data steps from the MDP, like for example here, three-step TD, we take three transitions where we observe the data which we receive from the MDP, from the environment, and then we bootstrap after the third step using the state value estimate. So therefore the consequence is that the, up, the estimate based on updating the state, for example, here, so if we want to update the state value or action value of the state at the beginning of this trajectory, we have to wait three steps, right? We have to wait until we actually arrived at this state three time steps later. And then when we have arrived there, we can basically propagate this back to the starting state of the trajectory and update the state value of our initial state three times steps back. So that means that we have a delay of three steps or in general of n steps, right? Here for Monte Carlo, we had to wait until the entire episode is finished. 
Here for TD0 or standard temporal difference learning, we had to, to wait one time step until we could make the update. And now with n step TD, we just have to wait n steps. And yeah, TD0 and MC, Monte Carlo, are basically these boundaries, the special cases of n step prediction and also n step control. So basically, uh, today we're going to handle everything which is here, like in between these extreme scenarios. So let's therefore also formulate the formal targets. Um, we just need to basically fuse together what we already learned. For Monte Carlo, just to have a little recap on this, the target was basically the entire trajectory from our initial reward which we receive until the reward at time step capital T. Capital T was the time step where the episode terminates. In, in the new nomenclature which we use here, GKT, that means the return, the sampled return from the current time step k until the time step capital T, which in our nomenclature means the terminal episode step. TD0, using this nomenclature, means then we utilize as a target from our current time step one time step into the future. So this rk plus one is basically the single data snippet which we take into account. And then we bootstrap right away using the state estimate of the successor state. And now, just as a log logical generalization, we can introduce n-step TD, which basically means as a target of the update, we utilize up to k plus n steps. So we use n samples, n reward samples, which are of course discounted as normal. And then at the n-step, we basically use the bootstrapping uh, based on the state value estimates of the state which we are visiting n steps later. So therefore approximation of a full return series truncated after n steps. And of course what could happen is if we have an episodic environment where these n step, let's say look ahead, is going into a time step which would be after the termination of our episode. So let's say uh, we have a, a board game and the, the game is over because one opponent win the game. Uh, and in this last step, we might have a n step TD algorithm which has like three look ahead steps. So then, okay, one step is the, the game has finished and then we have still two steps more. But for these two steps more, there would be nothing, right? Because the game, the episode, has already terminated. And in this case, what will happen is, of course, that all elements of this target, which address time points, which are beyond the termination, would be just set to zero, right? Because if this game, in my example, has ended because one player has won, of course, all subsequent returns and also state value estimates would not exist and would just be set to zero. The end step to the update step is then as learned as usual. We have introduced this already last week. And now the only change, the only change in contrast to last week is that we have exchanged now this target here of the update, right? So we basically use this error here between our estimate and the target. We do a little gradient descent step, so to speak, based on our current state value estimate. And the target of this little gradient descent step is just based now on the n step TD target, taking into account up to n steps, right? So here's really nothing new except exchanging here this definition on G. I hope everyone sees that. Okay, delay of n steps for obvious reasons, because if we want to update the state value estimate of state x at time step k, this return or approximated return, simple return, is just available n time steps later. So that means that an update of the state value of time step k of x 
the state X would need to be updated and time steps delayed. And of course, as I've already mentioned, there would be like additional time steps or auxiliary time steps required if an episode has ended that we basically process also the data which is there after the terminal step, such that also all other states which have been visited previously before the terminal step are updated. The interesting thing regarding nsteptd is that we can also show that nsteptd basically converges towards uh, a bias-free expectation over the true return that is called the error rejection property. And basically what this inequality says that if we take into account n as a rather large time step, that this right-hand side of this inequality constraint will be reduced, assuming that gamma is especially here uh, a factor which is lower than 1. So if there would be some factor lower than 1 to the power of n, n being large enough, that would basically mean that this right-hand side as an upper bound is basically lower and lower and lower, and therefore our return uh, expectation here will become more closely to the true state action value or the true state value. So therefore, if we have theoretically an infinite number of steps and an infinite number of um, data points, then the theorem basically tells us that TD in step TD will also result into bias-free and accurate estimates of the state value. However, of course, in reality, we normally do not have infinite many steps and infinitely many data, and therefore we can consider n as our n step td parameter more like a general hyperparameter and tuning parameter of our algorithm, right? So with Monte Carlo and td0, we don't have this parameter. We just take all the data samples or we just use one data sample. But now we also have all opportunities in between. And therefore, depending on our application, we can try to search for n as a hyperparameter such that this estimate, this estimation problem converges to an accurate value as soon as possible. So it's basically just an hyperparameter and configuration parameter of the estimator. And of course, in an application, oriented context, that also means that there is not typically one fits all solution, meaning that the number of n step samples which you should take into account can change between different applications. We will also see a small example later on um, where we will see the effect of changing n um, over different values. The algorithmic implementation of n step TD is normally straightforward. So what do we need? We need a policy which should be evaluated as a parameter. Now we have two parameters which we need to set up. We have the step size. We have already discussed about the step size at the beginning of the learning process. It makes sense to have large steps such that we can converge quicker. And then at the end where we want to learn the details of the state value functions, it makes sense to reduce alpha. And now as a second parameter of this problem, we have the prediction steps n for the estimator. We initialize all the state value estimates arbitrarily, except the terminal ones, which needs to be set zero for formal reasons. And then over the different episodes and over the different uh, steps of the episode, we basically take our data by choosing action, actions from the policy. We observe the state transitions and the rewards. And then basically what we do is we have a second, yeah, not a loop, but basically a recursive algorithm which takes care about all tau time steps of the future, which are basically these up to n time steps of the future, giving our current time step k. And within this loop, so if tau is basically not a terminal state or terminal time step, then what we basically just do is we formulate our, um, our target of TD um, nstep td and we update our state value estimate using our new nstep td target. So basically, very similar to td0 from last week, 
but here basically this part is now changed much where we need to accumulate n step data and then do bootstrapping. Here's also this little example which I was talking about. So uh, a very generic example of a Markov reward process actually. So what do we see here is basically we have a very simple um, random walk Markov reward process where we start here like in the middle of this state of change. If from the middle, by chance, we would basically uh, travel to the left hand side, we would see that over the transitions we would get all these zeros and then at the end we would get a minus one. And if we would travel to the right hand side, at the very end we would get a one. And of course, by sampling from this very simple Markov reward process, we can try to estimate the state values of all these different states from A to S, which are in total 19 states. And what's shown here on the left hand side is the average root mean square error of the state values of all these 19 states. I hope that you all see that the state values here on the right hand side should get positive values, right? Because we are coming closer to this one. And here on the left hand side, they should get negative because we are closer to getting this reward of minus one. And what is shown here is basically over different alphas, so over different step sizes of the TD learning step, we see the error for different number of steps which we consider for the n step TD update. So n equals one would be our TD which we have learned last week where we directly bootstrap after the first data sample. And TD 512 would be like de facto Monte Carlo learning. So we would wait until the episode has ended. And what we can see here from this uh, example where only 10 episodes are considered, so this is somehow a very early learning stage, right? If we just reinitialized our problem 10 times. Um, that we can see in this specific application context that a step size of 0.4 or maybe a little bit less than 0.4 and up to n data samples in the n step TD would be optimal in order to reduce the estimation error to a minimal value over the first 10 episodes. Yes, John. The alpha is our step size here of the TD update. So the alpha is, where we have it? This one, this parameter, right? So that's basically, if there's any deviation between our state estimates uh, and our target of a specific state that we utilize that in order to make an update to our state estimator. Right? So in this example, so these two values here together succeed or provide the best possible uh, accuracy. However, as I've already changed, this is just an application example. So the picture can change already if we take into account more episodes, right? So 10 episodes is, uh, I would call it a very early training stage. If we would learn more in that sense that we would run through the um, MDP or MRP more often, like 100 times or 1000 times, we would maybe see that if it's really learning about the details, that maybe alpha being set to smaller values is more beneficial, or we would also see that maybe a different value of n is beneficial. So in that sense, it's just an example. Uh, and the takeaway message is that now these two parameters together are the tuning parameters of our estimator. So these are the knobs which we can turn in order to find the most performant estimator which converges quick and to the most accurate steady state value. And for n-step prediction, that's actually also everything which we need to introduce so far. Because it's just an additional degree of freedom which we can utilize in order to build an estimator which is more application oriented, more application fitting, then TD0 and Monte Carlo learning.
That's it. Okay? Any questions to this? Yes. You mean if they converge to the same state value estimate? Yes. So that is basically derived also from the theorem. Um, so if we would have infinitely many data points and infinitely many times, then all three estimator types, which we have already learned, Monte Carlo, standard TD, TD0, and n step TD, they will all converge to accurate state value estimates. But of course, this is a theoretic finding, a theoretic claim, which normally cannot be found in reality because we do not have infinite the amount of data. But theoretically, yes, they would converge into the same expected state value estimate. Other questions? Good. Then I would say let's continue um, with n step control and I hope that you already guessed that the transfer to n-step control is now as trivial and as simple as n-step prediction. Because n-step control, or more specifically, n-step control in an on-policy fashion, so that means Zaza, of course, is now really straightforward. So what we see here in equation 6.6 .6 is just a recap. So that is no, no new thing. This is just the Zaza equation from last week where our estimation now targets on the state action values, Q. And our target last time was again this one-step target where we use one data sample on the reward and then we directly bootstrap, right? But for Zaza, we now need estimations on the state action values, Q. And if we want to do n-step Zaza, it's more or less the same. We just exchange our target again with the n step target for Q. So we take up to n sampled rewards, data driven rewards, and then we bootstrap using our estimator itself. Right? So, same scheme, but now on the Q values for on policy TD based control. And of course, if again here, if an episode terminates and potential elements of the series are beyond the terminal step of the episode, then we just set them to zero because there would be no further rewards and the terminal state of uh, an episode also does not have any additional state value or state action value. So that would be then just a straightforward modification or extension of end step learning to control using on-policy learning. There's also a variant of it, which I just want to basically quickly bring up to your attention. We don't go here into details, but we could also utilize n-step TD for an expected update. So in this case, what we would do is we would also again sample up to n rewards from the, um, just from the MDP as data samples. And in the last step, what we do we do an expected update in that sense that we consider all possible outcomes of our policy, uh, which is basically then interesting if our policy is a stochastic policy. Right? If our policy is unstochastic, this expected update, where we basically weight the Q values over all potential actions giving a certain state X, then this, of course, would boil down in the deterministic case to just to this target. And in the expected case, we would also make a difference here regarding the outcomes of different actions. However, this is just a, I would call it a detail or a variant. In any case, if we now do n-step TD, again here also in the Zaza case, the only difference is that we exchange our target and our goal is again, of course, 
in an on-policy fashion to learn the Q value. The Backup diagrams for n-step Zaza, including expected Zaza, are also more or less the same as in the TD case. One-step Zaza just taking one transition into account, n-step Zaza taking n steps into account, Monte Carlo taking all steps into account until the episode terminates, and in the variant of expected Zaza, what we basically just do is here in this last step that we do not bootstrap just based on the state action combination where we specifically transit to, but also that we take into account if there are multiple transitions possible in that sense that our policy is a stochastic one. So maybe with, I don't know, 50% probability we do this action with 25 this and 25 this, that we basically bootstrap over all three actions with the weighting of the probability giving the policy at this state. Okay? So that would then basically uh, be a more complex update, right? Because we have to bootstrap basically not based on one, but based on multiple state action combinations, which we could take here at the end of the uh, end step bootstrapping. But of course, it would be also somehow more accurate because we take into account that in this state, that not only the specific action which we have taken is possible, but also other actions giving a stochastic policy. However, as I said, this will be more like an, uh, yeah, I would call it little outlook. We will not really make use of it. It's just to bring it up to your attention that we can also update it in this way. In step Zaza is then uh, also in the algorithmic implementation, very similar to last week. The main change is basically also here at the end of the algorithmic implementation, where at this level here, we just modify our target using the n step sampled return estimates of the Q value and then implement the target here into our update equation. And of course, uh, that is also important here again, if we want to utilize Zaza in order to find the best possible state action values attached to the best possible policy, then of course in the last step we have to evaluate our policy actions based on epsilon greedy uh, policy improvements uh, giving our newest state action value targets Q. Yeah, in this figure here we also visualize the differences between the learning variants which we have already learned so far. So what do we see here is basically just a very simple arbitrary grid world example. Uh, the goal obviously of this grid work example is to find the terminal state G, our goal state, our target state. And um, if an agent is navigating, let's say randomly, doesn't matter, in this grid world example, then these different arrows, which we see here, basically indicate the three variants of learning which we have learned so far. On the left-hand side, we have the Monte Carlo update, which would basically just update if the, um, term, if the goal state has been reached, it would just update this state here based on the entire trajectory. So this would be Monte Carlo. Then one step Zaza from last week, assuming that we have this state transition at the end, would just update this state or state action value combination. And end step TD would basically summarize and memorize all the different steps in between and would do updates to, in this case of 10 steps Zaza, up to 10 different previous steps, right? And this, I, I feel, again, visualizes very well the yeah, intermediate solutions which we can get from n-step Zaza in contrast to one-step Zaza and Monte Carlo, right? So basically, this can give rise to the question, given an application, does it make sense to uh, learn, let's say, based on, the, on long trajectories? So basically, if 
you consider, for example, uh, a chess game or backgammon or any kind of game where the final outcome of who won or what was the outcome of the experiment comes obvious at the very end, it maybe makes sense to have learning episodes which are like really long, right? Because at the beginning it might not be clear, okay, if somebody does a move on the chess game, is that now a good move or not? Because we do not really know the, the long-term consequences out of this. In these scenarios, it maybe makes sense to do something like uh, n-step uh, Zarza with n being very large, so something like close to Monte Carlo. While in contrast, um, if we have a problem which is like more like short-sighted, in that sense you're driving a car and you get, let's say, direct uh, feedback from your driving actions, like driving through a curve or something like that, then it might not be required to um, learn from driving maneuvers which you had done like an hour ago or something because the car dynamics, the scenery and so on, they change much quicker. And therefore, consequence is we have a trade-off decision between the learning delay, here we have 10-step delay, here we have one-step delay, and the number of updated state action values, here 10 steps or sta 10 state action values are updated, and here only one is updated, right? So there's just a trade-off, and as I've already mentioned, depending on the application, driving a car or learning how to win in a chess game might be different. And yeah, so the transfer to NSTEP TD is very simple, very straightforward uh, for Zaza as well. Um, any questions to that? Seems to be not the case. Then, Another somehow direct transfer, end step of policy learning. And then we're going to introduce something new. So end step of policy learning, maybe of policy learning is a very good uh, refresher here at this point um, to bring this to your attention. We have already discussed it in lecture number four on Monte Carlo learning, but now we will be also introducing it to end step uh, TD or end step SASA. So what was of policy learning, just the Refresher on that of policy learning was that we basically have two different policies which are separated from each other. We have the target policy pi, which is our, let's say, main policy, so to speak, the policy which we actually want to optimize, which we want to learn. And we have a behavior policy b, which is our policy which gives us exploratory actions and basically can guide us through different tasks, and based on the actions this behavior policy executes, the target policy should learn from. We had a requirement in order to make off-policy learning to become a successful learning process, and that was a so-called coverage requirement. So that means that in any um, state action combination or in any state where the action probability of our target policy is greater than zero, that our behavior policy must also have a probability of taking a certain action greater than zero, such that in any state action combination which is relevant to our uh, target policy, the behavior policy is also active and therefore can, uh, can process and generate data samples. In Monte Carlo learning, what we have already introduced and what we basically will just reapply and slightly modifi modify today for n-step learning was the so-called importance sampling ratio, rho, here in the definition of Monte Carlo, where we start in our current time step k and we end up at the terminal time step capital T. And what we basically did here, we did like a weighting, like a transformation of the likelihood following this trajectory based on the target policy and the likelihood of following a certain trajectory of states, actions, states, actions, and so on, given the behavior policy. And basically what the important sampling ratio gave us is that this behavior is luckily only depending on our uh, 
policy ratios, right? Because in an unknown MDP, we would not, not, we would not have access to the state action uh, transition probabilities. And the result from this is basically just a mapping how likely it is to see a certain trajectory in the behavior policy and how likely would that be to see the same trajectory in the uh, target policy and basically map this relatively to each other. So this was Monte Carlo in that sense that we defined it for the entire episode. And now in end-step learning, we utilize the same idea. We map a mapping between the two policies. And basically what we do is we introduce again the important sampling ratio rho, but the only difference is now that we consider it either up to n steps into the future or until the episode ends. So basically we do this important sampling on a receding horizon, on a rolling horizon. So we don't do it only until the last step of the um, episode, but maybe just for n being five or n being 10 steps, we look how large the probabilities are to follow this trajectory which we have sampled using the target policy, how big is the uh, likelihood to see this trajectory using the behavior policy, and then we map it towards each other. And then based on this mapping, we basically correct this correction factor, so we correct the correction, it's maybe a little bit awkward wording, but that's basically what it is. It's an additional weighting or an additional correction to our step size, right? And analogously, we can also do this not only for the state values, but also in the SASA sense here for the state action values that we again update here our little learning step with a modified step size giving additionally this important sampling ratio rho. So very straightforward again. Um, only difference is now that we basically do it on this receding horizon intervals and not for the entire episode. The algorithmic implementation uh, in contrast to n step td for off policy learning is very similar now. The only difference I have marked here in red is of course that we need to update and monitor the important sampling ratio and then consider the important sampling ratio for the update step. And the same for Zaza in terms of learning the Q values. We monitor and calculate the important sampling ratio and consider it here for the update. And that's already it, what we need to consider for end step of policy learning. We reutilize the important sampling idea, mapping the relative probabilities between target and behavior policy with each other and do this on a receding horizon. Any questions to that? Seems to be not the case. Okay. And now becomes, uh, we come to actually the only really new thing, I would call it. So these are small generalizations of the concepts which you have already learned so far. But TD Lambda will be, will be now the different thing which we have not considered so far. We will take two, three intermediate steps um, towards the concept of TD Lambda. So uh, the first couple of slides which you will see will lead us through this way. And then after these two, three intermediate steps, we will actually introduce what we refer to TD Lambda. Okay. For these steps towards TD Lambda, the first thing which we need to take into account are so-called compound updates or average updates. What do I mean with that? I mean with that, that this would be the next step of generalization of our n-step updates, right? So I've said that n, our number of, of look-ahead values, is a hyperparameter, a tuning parameter of our estimator. So what we can also do now is we can combine basically two, three, four, or how many different estimators. One is running, for example, with n being one step, 
And another one, as in this example, is running with n being three steps. And then what we do is basically a so-called ensemble building, which is also a standard technique in machine learning. And we basically built an ensemble out of the target of the one-step TD together with the output or the target of a three-step TD. And such that this makes sense, of course, we have to weight this, that these weighting factors together make a weighting of one such that we do not get a bias target, right? So these weightings, of course, are here just arbitrary. For example, it could be also vice versa. So we could take two thirds here, one third there, or any other number of the weighting parameters, unless the sum of the weights is still one, right? And this would be just a very small generalization in that sense, okay, maybe it is good to take into account different n-step horizons and put them together in an ensemble. In the reinforcement literature, this is also, as I've mentioned already verbally, sometimes called the compound updates. But the yeah, simple truth is here is just an averaging, an averaging over different n-step targets or sub-targets. Okay? That's the first step towards TD lambda. The finding that we can combine different targets together in a weighted, average way. If we combine different sub-targets together for different step sizes, the question, of course, naturally comes up, how to define these weightings, right? As I said, these weightings are arbitrarily. Here it's one third to two thirds, it could be also vice versa. And a very typical weighting scheme is called the lambda returns. That is not yet TD lambda, this is just the lambda returns, which we will need for TD lambda. And the idea of the lambda returns is very simple. We just make an exponential scaling and exponential weighting. So the very first samples are assuming that lambda, of course, is smaller than, than 1, will be weighted comparably high, right? So if n is 1, that would be like lambda to the power of 0, which is obviously 1. And then if n is 2, that would be just lambda. If n is 3, this would be lambda square, lambda to the power of 3, lambda to the power of 4, and so on. So this is basically an exponential weighting. And if you do the geometric series of this exponential weighting decay, then you will also find out that the weights all together will always be 1, considering that the series goes to infinity. So therefore, this exponentially decaying weights fulfill the property of having a sum of weights being one, such that we get an unbiased target, an unbiased goal. And the rational, the intuition behind, obviously, is somehow intuitive, because it basically tells us, let's weight the samples which are newer, which are more recently available, let's weight them more, in contrast to the data samples, which have been like 10 steps or 100 steps ago, right? Somehow, I feel this, I hope you feel it also, this is somehow uh, intuitive that you say, okay, if we get new experience, new data, let's take this into account more heavily than data which is already quite old, right? So this would be here the recent data, this would be here, so to speak, the old data, or the targets based on this data. And this is basically the rational uh, behind lambda returns. Let's do a weighting based on the age, so to speak, of the data. Right? So uh, coming back maybe to my chess game example, um, if you're in the final stage of the game and you can make a checkmate move, then the specific move on how you do this checkmate move that might be super important, right? So it's it's the most recent action which you pro, uh, which you do, and obviously this should be weighted very much in the sense of doing a 
target formulation for the state value or action value estimator. In contrary, you had like some moves which led to this checkmate opportunity, which are of course also important, but it's maybe also somehow uncertain which of these previous moves of this previous decision actually were the important ones in order to make a difference, in order to be able to make a checkmate move at the end. So therefore, it's also somehow an uncertainty balance that we say more recent data samples are more certain in that sense that they have led to the current state of the MDP, while states and actions which are more in the past, they are uncertain and it's unclear how much impact they had to become uh, or to, to end up in the current state. Okay, so exponentially weighting. And um, if you have a look at our lambda return definition, the series here goes to infinity. So um, that is a definition which would be valid, therefore, for continuing tasks which do not have any end, right? Because only if it's a continuing task and we would have infinitely many states, then the weight would be one in the sum, which is of course required to have a averaging. What is happening if we have a terminal state, so an episodic task? In this case, we basically need to split up our, uh, our weights or our sum of weights. All states or sub-targets until the terminal state are basically weighted again in this exponentially manner. And all the, let's say, the, the, the weighting amount between these weights and the weights which we would need up to sum up to one, this residual weight is then assigned to the final time step, right? So the residual weight, the final weight, which is here calculated as lambda to the power c minus k minus one, this would be this area basically, is then assigned to the final return sample at the final time step. Okay, so this would be the definition for, um, for episodic tasks so such that this area under the weighting curve becomes basically a one and such that we can uh, average everything up in an unbiased way. And now, why are this definition or generalized definition for episodic tasks, we can also again find two extreme cases here. The one extreme case, lambda, our tuning parameter, becomes zero. That would be basically TD zero, right? Because if lambda becomes zero, then if we have a close look here, that would be basically then just this part here, and this would be just one step bootstrapping. So that's TD zero or one step bootstrapping from last week. So that's why we also call it TD zero, because this zero from the lambda basically results in uh, the standard TD update, one step update. And if we would put in lambda being one, that would basically mean that this decay is not really there, right? It would be a flat line. The height of the line would be, of course, depending on the number of samples, right? So that the sum of uh, weights is again one, but the weighting line would be basically a straight line indicating that we weight all samples equally large, equally heavy, and there would be no difference. So that means that the most recent data sample is as important and as much weighted as data samples which have been already like 10 years old, right? So therefore, this lambda is something like our discount rate gamma for the rewards, but with respect to the importance of our, of our importance uh, towards data samples and data ages. 
Therefore, if you put lambda close to one, that would mean that we are interested in um, considering data for learning over long time spans, lambda being close to one, we consider data intervals that are very long. And if lambda goes to zero or is close to zero, that would mean that we only take into account data spans of a very short amount of time. Right, so it's similar interpretation than gamma, of course, with a completely different viewpoint here, because gamma, our discount rate of the MDP, is basically a problem parameter. And here, lambda is a solution parameter in terms of our estimator. Okay, so I feel that this figure here is really a very good takeaway message because it makes clear uh, that we have an exponential weight over the different samples and the weighting severeness, so the curve, basically depends on lambda, right? So if lambda would be close to zero, then this would become even like heavier bulk together. The lambda return definition, which we basically had previously, is also not really feasible for continuing tasks. Why is it not feasible? Of course, mathematically, it is feasible, right? Because we have a weighting sum of one, but it's not practical feasible in that sense that uh, if we have a continuing task and we have to wait until we are able to weight all the samples, that would mean we have to wait for infinity, right? So we have a weighting series over all data points and all data points means there is no end. Not so good. So basically what's the turnaround or the, the, the um, Compromise here, uh, we call this truncated lambda returns. That is basically more or less the same for the um, episodic task that we basically truncate and distribute all the residual weights to the final time step here. But we basically do this in a um, variable way in that sense that we define uh, steps uh, size, or not step size, uh, number of steps h which is basically our truncation interval. So if we have a continuing task, we take into account up to H steps for these waiting updates, and then uh, we are able to just wait up to these H steps, do an update, and move on. Okay. But here comes the problem. Even if we do these truncated updates, that means that we still have to wait eight steps, uh, H steps, right? So we have to wait until H data points are there, H rewards, and then we can do an update. So that means we have a delay. And this delay is called, or comes from the so-called forward view. So what does that mean? If we want to update the state, of the current time step, utilizing our returns and our targets, as we have done it so far, they are future-oriented, right? So we're looking uh, into the forward view in time. So that means if we want to update this state, we have to wait until these states and rewards and action pairs are actually really there, and then we can update them backwards in time. But we have to wait until this very last time step has been reached and the result of this entire trajectory is there. So therefore, uh, lambda returns so far are just a concept in this forward-looking forward view as n-step TD, TD0, and Monte Carlo, and the only thing which is different here is that we might assign different importance weights to the samples. Lambda returns basically just says this sample is more important than a sample back here in the future, which is uncertain. Okay, and now comes the new thing. So we have learned about weighting, that is all also new, of course. But the new thing is that, that we can reverse 
this concept. And the idea is now that if we want to update an estimate of a value, state value, action value, doesn't matter, um, that we can also do this at the very same time point, or at least one time step into the future, because we have to wait for the reward associated. But this backward view is basically monitoring what state action transitions have been happened in the past. And based on monitoring what have happened in the past, we update the current state value estimate. So that's basically the same concept. We take into account a weighted sum, a weighted um, series of data points into account to update this state value estimate. But we don't do it in a forward view, but into a backward view. And the interesting thing is, if we do that, we do not have this waiting time, right? We can update this guy more or less instantaneously. So we don't have the delay. And potentially also we have some implementation opportunities here using recursive implementation. Because, maybe I go back to this slide here. This is an exponentially waiting process, right? And I hope that all from you know, as this is an electrical engineering class, exponentially waiting can be done very nice recursively using low pass filters, right? So a low pass filter, a PT1 filter, is basically just an exponentially waiting of past data observations. So what is derived here in this forward view domain where we have to wait until all the data has arrived, can be implemented also in a backward way just by using a PT1 filter. So basically, everything which we have prepared for now, with this exponentially waiting, is now to utilize this exponentially waiting and implement it recursively in a low-pass filter, PT1 style approach, and that is called then TD lambda. So that is basically the um, big new idea here. And in order to do so, we need to implement uh, or to say uh, an auxiliary quantity and, 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 and memory quantity, so to speak. We call this an eligibility trace, which is denoted as Z. And the eligibility trace, these are here these these stats, in terms of our filter implementation, of our recursive filter implementation, these are basically just counters or memories on how often we have visited a certain state in the past, such that we can assign it more weight to the updates than others. So eligibility trace is basically just in memory an auxiliary memory telling us how often we have visited a certain state in the past and therefore how important it is for our current update. How is the eligibility trace defined? In a finite MDP, we can also uh, define this in multiple ways for continuous MDPs, but in a finite MDP, it is basically in recursively updated counter with exponential delay. How is this equation to be interpreted? We initialize the eligil eligibility trace with zero, so that basically means we have not visited the state yet. And then every time we visit a certain state x at time step k, we add up a one if in a certain time step we do not visit a specific state, we do not add up something that would be that zero. And this also means that the eligibility trace needs to be defined for every state separately. So that means if we have 10 states in an MDP, we also have 10 eligibility traces. Hence, every 
state has its own eligibility trace, meaning how often, how important a certain state seems to be for the MDP in terms of estimation or control. And here, at this point, this is now our PT1 filter, right? So this is what everyone should know from uh, system theory or control engineering. This is basically just our recursive PT1 filter. Our new eligibility trace is the old one discounted with gamma and lambda. And this would be the input to the filter. This would be the, the right-hand side of the PTN filter. If it's visited, we bump it up by one. If it's not visited, we don't bump it up. And based on this definition of the eligibility trace, here in the figure, we have an example eligibility trace of a single state, right? So this is the eligibility trace over time of a single state. If we would have 10 states in an MDP, we would have 10 of such figures. And the interpretation of this figure is that every time, this would be this dash here, we are visiting this specific state, which we are looking at, we bump up the eligibility trace, which is this plus one. And then when we not visit it is, we do not visit it again. Its importance, its weight, its, yeah, its importance for the MDP basically reduces until we eventually visit it again, again, and so on. So this is then basically this memory long-term memory, which tells us how important a certain state is. And this importance is scaled in this exponential way, as we have introduced it in lambda returns. So the eligibility traces are our method, our measure, in order to transfer this lambda return concept in the forward-looking view into the backward facing view. And as mentioned, this is implemented here in a recursive fashion because the recursive implementations are always easy to program. Okay. So now in the last step, we just have to bring it together. And this last step is then actually the TD Lambda target or the TD Lambda updates. The TD Lambda updates, they look here for the state value in the first place exactly like the normal TD update, right? Here we have the TD update for one bootstrapping step. And the only difference is now that here on the right hand side of this equation, we weight this update with the eligibility trace of the state x, which state value should be updated here on the left hand side, right? So this is then basically our time discounted weight over the eligibility trace, meaning that, okay, if we have visited this state many times, very often in the past, this update is important, we boost up, basically the weight, and if the eligibility trace is low and we have not visited the state so often in the past, that means it seems to be less important for the MDP, so don't give so much weight to it. The same thing is done for the action values. Looks like in the first place a standard TD or Zaza zero update. And here on the right hand side is again this eligibility trace waiting over time. And obviously what we see from this equation that we can update now the Q values and the values, state values, directly after each state transition, right? We transit from XK taking action UK to XK plus one. So this update is directly possible after the transition. So we have to just wait this one minimal time step. We do not have any additional delays, which is a super uh, pro argument 
and we just weight this additionally based on past experience. So therefore, advantage, recursive updates based on past updates, no additional waiting time. But I've mentioned that also, we have an eligibility trace for all state, right? This is a function of states, so we need to store as many eligibility traces as states are there in the state space. And of course, that means that our memory demand will be increased accordingly, right? So if we have 100 states, we would have also 100 state value estimates, and we would then also have 100 additional eligibility traces, which is in disadvantage, which we have to take into account. If we update now our grid world example figure from a few minutes ago, these three figures we have already discussed, Monte Carlo style update, single Zaza step update, 10 step Zaza update in the forward view. And now with Zaza Lambda or TD Lambda, we have basically the opportunity to take into account the entire trajectory which we have followed so far. And we can update all the state action values here, but we weight them based on different relevances with respect to the past. Here, the lambda parameter was set to 0.9. So we can see that the importance with respect to time is decreasing backwards here, such that this update here of this initial state or state value is more or less minimal. We could, of course, also implement or get the same um, kind of figure if we do the lambda returns together with um, normal multi-step Zaza and the forward-looking view. So in this figure, we don't see if it's like a recursive implementation using TD Lambda or a forward-facing implementation. We just see the result, and the result from this is the exponential weighting. So therefore, the key takeaway message regarding TD Lambda is that we combine two things together. The one thing is that we take together multi-step updates on past data and in an, that these are weighted in an exponentially decaying fashion, which offers us the opportunity to implement it in a recursive, backward-oriented fashion. And that's basically the importance of Zaza Lambda or TD Lambda, which is also easy to implement. Right? Because what we just need to implement additionally is this line, right? So you, you can take TD0, you can take uh, Zaza0, which we have learned last week. You just add up this line in the algorithm. Let's record, let's monitor the eligibility traces, and then you just need to modify here the update uh, equations and that's it. Any questions to TD Lambda, Zaza Lambda, or the backward facing view? Good. Then I would say we close it for today uh, because that's the important part I wouldn't it to transfer today. Uh, next week we are going to continue with uh, planning and somehow model based reinforcement learning. Um, however, I will not be here, so Daniel will take care of you in the lecture. He will do his very best. <laughs> uh, I will be here also not next week, over next week, and in three weeks. <laughs> uh, Wilhelm will take care um, of the lecture in, in two weeks. Yes, and there will be at least one week, which is actually no lecture, no exercise, either in two weeks or in three weeks. I have to look it up in the schedule myself. Uh, but I will write a Panda message today, so to let you know, I am out of office for three weeks and Daniel Wilhelm will take over the lecture and one appointment will be cancelled. Um, 
And we will see us then, I think, on 8th of June again. No, 7th of June again, which is in four weeks.